In this episode, let's have a first look at the Sound Devices 633 mixer and recorder. Now, we've looked at several recorders and recorder mixers in the past, generally at the consumer and prosumer level. The question I've gotten several times is, well, why are these professional recorder and mixers so expensive? Why, why do they cost $3,000 more than the what seems like the equivalent consumer or prosumer type of recorder? And when I say consumer or prosumer, I'm really referring to a lot of the recorders like the Handy series from Zoom. So that's going to be the H4n, the H5, the H6. Um, talking about the Tascam DR series of recorders, the DR60D, and uh, so on and so forth. So those really I would consider more prosumer um, and on the lower end perhaps even more consumer. But the difference has a lot more to do with things other than just sound quality, although that's part of it, and just build quality, although that's also part of it as well. So what are these amazing additional features <laughs> that make these recorders cost so much more? Well, there are several types of things that are required generally by professional level productions. When you're actually out there earning money as a sound mixer, there are some things you have to deliver to your clients that you can't necessarily do well or at all with a lot of the consumer types of recorders. Let's take a closer look. And this is, again, just a really high-level overview. There's so much more to cover on the Sound Devices 633. We'll come back to those in a future episode. First of all, and we've talked about this before with some of the other recorders, the Sound Devices 633 actually has analog limiters in the analog stage of the recorder. What that means in practical terms is that if a sound suddenly gets very, very loud, the limiter can actually manage that and keep it from getting so loud that once it gets to the analog-to-digital converter, it distorts. So this is something that you're not going to see in a lot of those consumer grade or prosumer recorders, including the Zoom F8, because those are all implemented in the digital stage after the damage has already been done. If you'd like to see a good example of that, or hear an example of that, I should say, go back to this video where we looked at this on the Zoom F8. Now here's an example where I had the gain set up so that I could record dialogue like this, and then I suddenly got much louder and started yelling. This is what the limiters did, and you can see that it actually prevented this audio from being unusable. It actually was very usable. It was able to manage the very, very loud <laughs> part of the, this yelling and screaming, and that's a huge difference. Check, one, two. We are yelling to see if this limiter can handle this loud. Now, one obvious thing is that the 633 is actually a mixer with a really good recorder built into it. <laughs> Whereas a lot of the consumer and prosumer devices are really kind of recorders with a few mixing features. We'll talk more about mixing and how important that is for professionals and why it's important for them. Another one that's very similar that is also implemented in the analog stage of the Sound Devices 633 is a high pass filter. We haven't talked a whole ton about those, but what a high pass filter does is it prevents very, very low frequency sounds from actually making it into the recording. And in the case of the Sound Devices 633, that low, the high pass filter is actually implemented in the analog stage before the preamplifier. What that means in practical terms is you can actually set where it's going to roll off. So you can say, I don't want anything below, say, for example, 80 hertz, or I want it to roll off starting at 80 hertz. And what that means is that all of that sound down in the really, really low frequencies like wind, um, rumble, like if the microphone uh, picks up a little bit of rumble when you're moving the boom back and forth or whatever it may be, that actually gets taken out of the signal before it even goes into the preamplifier to get amplified. And the practical benefit of this is that you're never going to, or you're very unlikely going to overwhelm the preamplifier with these low frequency rumbling sounds. Again, another case where you're less likely to have to do a retake and you're able to, to more efficiently uh, use the resources of the production that you're working on. Now, as you might imagine, the preamplifiers actually sound really, really nice as well. Here's an example. This entire episode is being recorded with the Sound Devices 633 and an Audio-Technica AT4053B hypercardioid microphone. In terms of gain, the preamplifiers can provide 72 dB of gain, so it can power pretty much or amplify pretty much any microphone out there. 
Now, one of the big things people assume is that the build quality must be amazing on these. And in fact, with the sound devices, I think that's a fair assessment. These are very, very rugged. The body itself is made from carbon fiber with a metallic finish. It is, so it's relatively lightweight, but also incredibly sturdy. Also, the potentiometers are silky smooth and nice and large and easy to work with, so that if you are in a position where you need to produce a stereo mix, in addition to isolated tracks for each individual microphone or channel, you can mix very, very effectively with this type of fader. It's very easy to use, and it's much better <laughs> than what you're going to find on any of the consumer or prosumer level devices that I've used. The buttons and the other potentiometers are all, again, very solid. Some, several of them retract making it, again, easy to use and get the, they get the controls out of the way when you don't need them, but they're available when you do need them. Additionally, the buttons are splash-proof, so you have a little bit more insurance there in terms of being able to operate in adverse conditions. But it doesn't stop there either. The difference here is that you're also dealing with a company that caters to professionals. So if you do sustain some damage to your recorder at some point or your mixer, Sound devices actually will stand behind it in terms of being able to repair your device under most circumstances. So that's something that you really aren't probably going to find with a Tascam or a Zoom recorder under most circumstances, unless one of those companies kind of change. RF shielding is another area where this is a little bit different. On the 633, it is not only RF shielded on all of the panel's interiors, but also the seams are RF shielded. Now, that's not something you're gonna find on most of the consumer or prosumer devices as well. In fact, some of the consumer devices, I think, aren't even RF shielded at all. Another big difference is ergonomics. With a sound devices mixer and a recorder, the ergonomics are very, very carefully thought through. And while they're not perfect, uh, at least not for everybody, I would say, they, they definitely are a lot easier to use quickly when you're in those sorts of situations where you need to react quickly. And that makes a big difference. Again, that's a difference between having to do a retake or not. And again, that's gonna be very, very important for professionals. So what do I mean by that? Well, it goes down to lots of different things. The menu system is very well thought through and I find it very easy to use. Um, the, again, the controls are all very easy to use. They're very solid. They feel like they have a lot of years of use in them. Again, because there's such precision and um, just very highly high quality craftsmanship, really. You also have dedicated buttons and controls for things that you may not have on consumer and prosumer level devices. I think, um, I mean, a, kind of an extreme example is you think about the Zoom H4n, which I own, which I think is a fine device. So don't anyone take the wrong message away from here. But again, we're comparing something in two different entire leagues. But for example, on the Zoom H4n, to change the gain on one of the mic inputs, you have a rocker switch. And that's not something that's very convenient to use, <laughs> certainly while you're recording, if you have to make an adjustment during a recording. So that is a huge difference from what we're talking about here. In the case of the 633, not only do you have a gain trim, which retracts, which is something you kind of use to set up the channel initially before you start rolling, but then you also have the fader, um, which again is big. It's easy to identify which one is for which channel and it's silky smooth. And so any changes you make are very smooth and natural sounding. Also on the 633, you don't have to do a lot of menu diving while you're in the midst of recording. Another thing that makes a big difference is that there are four different ways to power the 633. You can use the external DC power with a battery like an Anton Bauer, like I use, and that comes in on a high rose or high rosy input. There are also two Sony NPF style battery docks on the back. So those are also uh, set up so that you can actually remove one and replace it while the other one is powering the unit. And those can be bought in various capacities and just those alone, you could probably power this recorder for an entire production day. By a production day, I'm talking 12, 14 hours. In addition to that, there are AA batteries. So you can use six AA batteries internally. Those aren't really a kind of bona fide or genuine way to power this recorder for an extended period of time. I really look at those as backup and they're going to power, you know, phantom powered mics and doing recording for a relatively short period of time. By that, I mean, probably about an hour has been my experience so far. So those are really just kind of meant as a backup option. And then in addition to all of that, there is an inbuilt, it's very small lithium ion battery, which they call power safe. And what that does is that if you run out of power on all of those other sources, then it will actually switch over to the PowerSafe battery long enough to actually close out the files, finish writing the files that you're currently recording, 
and safely power down a device. Another big difference is metadata. You can enter metadata into the Sound Devices 633, not only via its own controls, but you can also connect a USB keyboard. So if you happen to be working from a cart or a table, you can actually enter names, scene names, take name, you know, whatever it may be, uh, notes, and then you can actually generate a sound report at the end of the day just from the information that you've recorded on your card. So that's a huge difference as well. Again, if you're working in a, a production, a professional production or a professional capacity, and you're required to provide a sound report at the end of the day, which is a very important piece of information for a post-production crew to have, um, you can do that in a very, very simple and relatively automated fashion. So that makes a huge difference as well. The 633 also provides a temperature compensated crystal oscillator, which is a fancy name for a time code clock, which is highly accurate. And that means that you could actually use it in extreme temperatures and it will still remain accurate. And in fact, in this particular case, you can sync. And in a lot of cases, you'd probably use the recorder as either a... Uh, it would actually receive time code from another kind of dedicated device, or it could actually be the master clock, and you could sync the cameras to the time code clock in the Sound Devices 633. It's very accurate, and it's definitely up to the professional task. And that's something where you should need to, you know, depending on your camera, you may only need to sync once at the start of the day and should be good from there. The, it also supports all the different types of time code. So there are several types, there's free run, um, amongst others. And we'll go into that in another episode in the future, but it also supports all the necessary frame rates. So again, very well thought through. And again, something that differentiates it as a professional device. Outputs, routing, and buses. These are features that are a little harder to find on the consumer and prosumer level devices. You also have some auxiliary outputs. So for example, if you need to be recording and send a sound feed to the director and the assistant director and others on the set, you can do that very effectively, even if you need to send them a slightly different mix. So you can group things onto buses and then send them out different outputs. You can um, record to the stereo mix bus. I mean, you have all these different options. It's incredibly flexible, the things you can do, which means that as a professional, you can pretty much meet the demands of most situations. So that again is a differentiating factor. Another area where they did not skimp on the 633 is the headphone amplifier. On the lower end devices, this is an area where they almost always skimp and they're actually really pretty poor quality. And that's not just a kind of, I'm awesome, I'm an audiophile, I need to hear the best I can possibly hear while I'm on set. It's actually a practical consideration because if you're hearing noise in the headphone preamplifier, you need to be able to know whether that's a problem with your microphone, maybe a problem with your cable, maybe a problem with you have, how you have something else set up, or is that just noise in your preamplifier, your headphone preamplifier? So that is a really big important thing as well to help you solve problems on set when you need to act quickly. So that's really just a start. <laughs> There's so much more and so much more depth that we could go into, but I did get that question, you know, why are these so much more expensive and why would anyone ever want to use one? And in fact, when I did my Zoom F8 review some time ago, one of the comments, or some, I saw actually several comments of people saying, hey, it's so awesome to see Zoom making a sound devices killer. And I would say, no, it's not a sound devices killer. There's still plenty of things that a professional is not willing to give up to move to a sound, to move to a Zoom F8. I think a lot of professionals would consider using a Zoom F8 as a backup recorder because it is a very, very impressive piece of kit. But the sound devices, if they're a dedicated sound mixer out in the field, there's still some advantages with these types of devices over something like the Zoom F8. So I think they're great. Um, they each fill a niche, and I'm not here to suggest that everyone needs to run out and necessarily buy a Sound Devices 633, but I am saying there is justification for the difference in price. Now, if you are just shooting YouTube videos, you probably don't need a Sound Devices 633. However, if you are making a living or even a partial living with your work doing sound and video, the Sound Devices products are definitely worth checking out. I bought mine over at the DVE store, which is a West Coast based um, digital video equipment retailer. Um, had a great experience with it so far. And we'll probably see some more episodes in the future talking about some of the features here. Knowledge is power. The more you understand, the better you're able to make your productions work and the better artist you'll be. Hope that was helpful. Go ahead and leave any questions you have down below. And if you haven't already subscribed, make sure you do that and we'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound for video. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.